a, a common trope in literature where whenever something really bad is about to happen, uh, people sort of turn into meteorologists and they start talking about the shifting of the weather. When trouble is just around the corner, they'll say something like, an east wind is blowing in. Or when something ominous is on the horizon, they'll say a storm is coming or a storm is brewing. When a season of lack or a season of suffering is about to take place, people will talk about how winter is coming. Sherlock Holmes, who's one of my favorite characters of all time, is the king of this kind of meteorology. He's very perceptive. He always could tell when, when things were changing. Listen to this exchange he had with his good friend Watson. He said, there's an east wind coming, Watson. And Watson, being as simple as he was, says, I think not, Holmes. It's very warm. He doesn't get it, of course. Sherlock says, good old Watson, you are the one fixed point in a changing age. There is an east wind coming all the same. Such a wind as never blew on England yet. It will be cold and bitter, Watson. And a good many of us may wither before its blast. If you're ever reading a book, you're ever watching a movie, and dark clouds start to gather, or you hear thunder crashing, or you see lightning flashing in the distance, you know that in a matter of time, your hero is about to be knee-deep in something really bad. That's where we are right now in the Gospel of John. I know it might not seem like it since we're in chapter 12 and there's 20 chapters and chapter 12 feels like it's the middle, but this is the beginning of the end for Jesus. If John were writing in the 20th century, he might have said that it was getting dark and cold and lightning was flashing in the distance or uh, clouds were gathering overhead. But since he's writing in the first century, he doesn't know that that's what we do now. And he simply says, it was six days before Passover. Now, if you don't know anything about the Bible, that is okay. Passover is the day that Jesus is going to be hung up on a cross like a common criminal. So we are now six days from his crucifixion. Last chapter was chapter 11. Jesus went down to Bethany to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. And what we saw was that by going to Bethany, he was essentially sealing his fate. He knew that if he went down to Bethany, and so did his disciples, that he would be ultimately giving up his own life. That's why his disciples said in the last chapter, well, I guess we'll go die with him, because they knew that that's what he was doing. So everything that happens from this point on happens in the shadow of the cross. The east wind is blowing. There is a storm coming in. And yet, in the midst of this dramatic and ominous shift in atmosphere, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus throw Jesus a massive party. They throw him a dinner. It's literally the night before he's going to climb up on a donkey and ride into Jerusalem in his triumphal entry, you know? Everyone's going to say Hosanna, and they're going to think he's the king, and then days later they're going to uh, call out for his crucifixion. He's going to ride in as the Messiah. None of that is going to happen, though, until his friends have a party. They've got to celebrate one more time. Because why? Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. He's just demonstrated his love and his power and his glory in ways that they didn't even think possible, totally beyond their wildest imaginations. And so the natural response is to throw a party in his honor. That's what this is. Martha is serving like she always is. Mary is at Jesus' feet like she always was. And Lazarus is just chilling at the table, <laughs> taking it all in. Just try to imagine being Lazarus at this point. You're, you're dead for four days. Now you're not, and you're, you're at a party. You're just kind of like, what, what, what's going on right now? What would he have been thinking? But that's the scene. Here's the thing. If John 11 was all about Christ's love for us, and it was, and if you missed last week, that's totally fine. It's on the website. Check it out. If John 11 was all about what it looks like to be loved by Christ, John chapter 12 is all about what it looks like to love him in return. In fact, the display of love that we see in this story is so profound that Jesus says we will be talking about this display until he comes back. 
Matthew's account of the same story in Matthew 26, 13, Jesus says it this way, Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what Mary has done will also be told in memory of her. Talk about a legacy. For hundreds and even thousands of years, everywhere in the world that the gospel is proclaimed, people are going to talk about Mary and this display of love that she carries out at the party. So what was it about this display? What was it about her love that was so amazing? Why is it that we're still talking about Mary 2,000 years later as we're talking about Christ? There are three main things that marked her display, and that's what we're going to look at today. And if you're taking notes, you can just call these the three marks of love. The first one is that Mary's love was marked by extravagant worship. Look back at verse 3. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Judas gets really mad and reprimands her because this ointment was worth 300 denarii. Now the word extravagant has several meanings. Uh, It's a word that I don't use that often, but they all basically point to the same reality. I've got these four different definitions for you of this word extravagant. First, spending too much, characterized by spending excessively or wastefully. Second, Uh, beyond what is reasonable, exaggerated, or unreasonable. Third, unreasonably high in price. Unreasonably high in price or cost. Or fourth, flamboyant, profusely or exaggeratedly, I don't know if I said that right, decorated or showy. Now most of the time, when we use the word extravagant to describe someone or something, it's not a compliment. It's usually about someone who's wasting their money or being irresponsible with their money. My mind immediately went to the prosperity gospel and all of the, the, the preachers who peddle that gospel and their extravagant lives. You know who I'm talking about? Guys like John Gray, who paid $200,000 for a Lamborghini for his wife on their anniversary. It's extravagant. Or a guy like Kenneth Copeland, who's, who's one of the Dons. His ministry owns three private jets. And his most recent one, he bought for $3 million from the legend Tyler Perry. It's extravagant. These are the peddlers of the, the false prosperity gospel. I was talking to my friend, uh, Costi Hend, a few months ago on the podcast about this very thing. Because Costi grew up in this world. Uh, Costi's the nephew of like the legendary Don of the Prosperity Movement, Benny Hen. And so he traveled with his uncle Benny everywhere and was kind of the heir apparent to that ministry. And he talks about how extravagant their lifestyle was. He talks about owning Ferraris and Bentleys and Hummers and how his bedroom suite had a jacuzzi with gold plated uh, hardware <laughs> as a kid. How when they traveled the world, they stayed at hotels that were $16,000 a night. On and on the stories went. But now he looks back and he he realizes that it was way too extravagant. It's too much. Their spending was excessive. It was irresponsible, flashy, flamboyant. So typically when we use the word extravagant, it's not a compliment. We're calling people out. There's actually an Instagram account that it's like one of the only ones I I enjoy. It's called Preachers and Sneakers. And it basically just calls out a bunch of these prosperity preachers for their extravagance and talks about their $600 belts and their $1,000 shoes and all of that kind of stuff. But honestly, I can't think of a better word to describe the gift that we see Mary giving to Jesus. It is extravagant. It's irresponsible. It's flashy. It's flamboyant. The perfume she used... Uh, John tells us it cost 300 denarii. 300 denarii is massive. In fact, it's, it's, scholars would say it's at least ten to $25,000. One denarii was a worker's wage that he would w- earn for an entire day's work. So 300 was basically an entire year's salary. Think about how much money you made last year. 
That's essentially what we're talking about here with Mary. An entire year's salary. She has a box of this perfume and she just opens it up and pours it out. That's irresponsible. That's extravagant. It was the most valuable thing that she owned. She could have sold it. She could have tithed some of it to Jesus. She could have given some to the poor. She could have started a mission for some orphans. And all of that would have been great. But she didn't do all of that. She dumped it onto his feet and onto the ground. Everyone at the party (laughs) must have thought, that's too much, Mary. What in the world are you doing? That's too flashy. That's too flamboyant. That's beyond what's reasonable. But not Mary. And this is what you and I need to see about Mary's love for Christ in this moment. You see, what she was doing was she was pouring out her most precious possession, her most valuable possession. Why was she doing that? She was pouring out her most valuable possession because she had found something that was even more valuable. She was like the man in Jesus' parable who found a field that had treasure buried in it. And when he found the treasure, he went back and sold all of his belongings so that he could buy the field and own the treasure. That's what Mary had found. She had found the Messiah. She had seen his power and his glory and his love on full display. And so she realized that nothing in the entire world was more valuable than him, not even her most precious possession. As one author put it, and I love this, write this down, because I didn't say this. The value of Christ's perfections and the intensity of Mary's affections matched. The value of Christ's perfections and the intensity of Mary's affections matched. His worth and her worship corresponded. It made sense in light of who he was and how valuable he was. There was nothing in her heart that she valued more than him, and so she worshiped him without any regard for responsibility. (laughs) I love how St. Augustine once put it. He said, Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. He's not valued at all unless he's valued above all, and that's how Mary saw him. So in light of her vision of Christ, in light of what she thought about him, she got her most precious possession. Another gospel says she, she broke it open and she poured it out on his feet. Essentially what she was saying is, you're the most valuable thing in my life. You're the greatest treasure I've ever known. That's what he sh- she's showing him. Here's the big question. <laughs> Here's the obvious question. Does our love look like that? Does our love look like that? Have we done anything like bringing an alabaster box, our most precious possession? Honestly, guys, I don't have perfume that's worth it. I don't have I don't have anything. I don't have cologne. Probably should. I don't have anything that valuable. But have we ever brought the alabaster box of our lives and just laid it at his feet? Because I think what we value more than anything is our own life, right? Or I think for me, it'd be my family's lives. Just said, here, here's my family. You're more valuable to me than them. Whatever you want, God, I hold everything with an open hand. It's yours. You know what's really fascinating to me about that question? I've been thinking about this all week. What's fascinating to me about that, that question is I bet, I'm willing to bet the moment I asked it, just about all of us turned into his disciples. The moment I ask that question, do we love Jesus like Mary loves Jesus? Every single one of us turned in to the disciples who were watching Mary. How many of you, now don't raise your hands because again, I'm not, I'm not trying to embarrass you. I don't even really want to know. I kind of already assume I, I do know. But how many of you immediately felt like saying, that's too much? 
That's too costly. That's too expensive. I can never give everything I have for Jesus. What about the poor? No, that's too flashy for me. I, I'm too reserved. I'm too reserved in my affection to do that. Honestly, guys, when we see this extravagant display of love, what, what happens is we are confronted with the scantiness of our own love. At least that's how I feel. And so rather than following Mary's example, usually what I try to do, probably what you're trying to do right now is we try to discredit it. That's what the disciples were doing. <laughs> Why would you do that? Why not give it to the poor? But here's the truth that I need to see, that you need to see all of us today, even in this hour, we're praying that the Holy Spirit would help us see. So the truth is, when our heart is captured by the power and the glory and the love of Christ, all the excuses vanish. All of the protestations disappear. They're muted. And all that's left is a burning affection and passion. His worth and our worship will begin to correspond. And when that happens, no price will be too great. No gift will be too extravagant to give to him for all he has given to us. I, I think about uh, the, the famous missionary, Jim Elliott, who he's got this quote that just resounds uh, in my own mind on a, on a regular basis. Maybe you've heard it, but, but he once said, he is no fool who will give what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And of course, he's talking about Christ and his kingdom. He's talking about the pearl of great price, the treasure that was buried in the field, this possession that was more valuable to him than anything else in the world. It was the presence of God in the person of Jesus Christ. So he gave up everything to possess it. On January 8th, 1956, if you know his story, he, along with four other missionaries, poured out the alabaster box of their lives for their king. They didn't value their comfort. They didn't value their safety. They didn't hold tightly to their future or even their families. Their hearts had been captured by the king. And so it was an act of extravagant worship, they flew the gospel down to Ecuador so that they could take it to people who had never heard it before, the Alca Indians, except upon landing, the Indians executed them on the spot. Now later on, the story is incredible and has an amazing Indian ending, not Indian. His family went back, and these families went back. The wives and the kids went back to the same spot where their husbands had been executed. To the same people who had killed them. Except this time, they weren't killed on the spot, and they shared the message of Jesus Christ, and the entire tribe believed. So again, we have to ask ourselves the question, have we brought the alabaster box of our lives? Have we poured out every single drop for our king? Or have we held something back? What are you holding back today? Do his worth and your worship match? For Mary, they did. And her display was extravagant. The second thing that marked her love was humble Surrender. Again, look back at verse 3. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And I've capitalized that and I emphasized that so that you can see that that is really, really important. Because in those days, hair was really important. We're going to get to that in a minute, but first I want to show you um, what she was revealing about Jesus, the way that she viewed Jesus. In fact, you could look at this act as her communicating two things, the way she viewed Jesus and the way she viewed herself. And all of this is demonstrated by anointing with her hair. So first, how does this show us what she thought about Jesus? Well, in this context, 
In their culture, there were four classes of people in the first century who deserved or who were worthy of an anointing. Only four classes of people. Kings, high priests, prophets, and the dead. These are the only people who get anointed with this kind of perfume. The fact that she wiped his feet with her hair and this oil proved that she believed Jesus was all of those things. He was the king of kings, as Revelation 19 says. He was the high priest of heaven, Hebrews 3 says. He was the prophet that had been prophesied about long before the one who was going to be greater than Moses. He was dead but is alive forevermore, Revelation 1. And so in this act of worship, Mary is saying what she believes to be true about Jesus. This is who he is. He's my king. He's my priest. He's my prophet. And ultimately he's going to die in my place, which he had just told her in the chapter before. He wasn't just some carpenter turned teacher from Nazareth. He was the son of God. And that's what she was demonstrating by anointing his feet. So this act shows what she thought about Jesus, but it also shows what she thought about herself. And this is where hair is really important. Because in their culture, hair was the symbol of a woman's glory. It was never to be wore down in public. In fact, if you wore it down in public, you were a prostitute. It was their glory. In fact, there's a passage later on in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, that says, long hair is the woman's glory. Not only that, but guys, she's washing the feet of Jesus. And feet washing was a job that was, was reserved for slaves. And not just slaves, but Gentile slaves. If you were a Jew, you were not allowed to wash the feet of anyone. Because that was too demeaning. It was too degrading. It was too low. And so Mary takes this job upon herself. She humbles herself. She bows at the feet of Jesus. Essentially what she's doing here is she is acknowledging that her glory is nothing in the presence of Jesus. She lets her glory down and washes his feet. She trades her glory for his glory. You see that? She didn't just pour out her most treasured possession on his body. She poured it on his dirty, smelly, disgusting feet. And she wiped it off with her glory. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we see Jesus in the same way that Mary saw Jesus? And do we see ourselves in the same way that Mary saw herself? Those are really important questions. I was thinking about how this relates to the Titanic, not the movie, but the actual ship itself. The Titanic was a, a massive vessel, one of the greatest feats of modern engineering. Um, I have a picture here of a few men standing behind it so you can kind of get a feel for how big it really was. Sorry, that's actually a really dark picture, but they're standing behind the Titanic and you can barely see there's five men standing underneath it. It was 882 feet long, 92 feet wide, 104 feet high, and it weighed 46,328 tons. It's massive. Now, in the presence of the Titanic, every other ship in the harbor looked like nothing more than a little fishing raft, like something that you would make out of cardboard or like some, some logs, I don't know. In the presence of the Titanic, even the tallest man would be dwarfed, would look totally insignificant. And if, if you were on top of that 100-foot deck, they'd probably look like a little ant beneath you. Because in the presence of the Titanic's greatness, you would realize just how small you were. I would say that standing next to the Titanic would probably be one of the most awesome and yet humbling experiences that you could ever go through. And you know what's so fascinating about the greatness of the Titanic to me 
is the moment that that ship, that incredible, powerful, heavy, massive ship that dwarfed all other ships, the moment that it jetted off out of the harbor and into the open sea, you know what would happen to it? It would become small, tiny, insignificant. If you were looking at it from space, you wouldn't even be able to find it. A microscopic speck in the vastness of the ocean. This 882 foot long, 92 foot wide, 104 foot high ship would disappear surrounded by the open sea. Guys, the problem with our vision, the reason that most of us have a hard time seeing ourselves as we really are is because we're stuck in the harbor. We're stuck in the harbor. We're so busy comparing ships to ships and people to ships that we miss reality. Some of you see yourself as really great and really powerful and, and really glorious. That's because some of you have never been swallowed up by the ocean. Some of you might actually be the Titanic. I don't know everyone in this room, but I know there are a lot of talented people in here. Wealthy good-looking, significant. When you walk into the room, everyone notices because you stand out above all the rest. That's right. <laughs> I saw that. You might be the Titanic in the harbor, and so you got a really hard time moving past your own glory. Some of you are like, I know I'm not the Titanic. I'm the, I'm the dwarf at the, the foot of the Titanic. It's okay. Some of you see yourself as great. And so because of that, in a lot of ways, you think, man, I'm doing God a favor. I'm doing God a favor by giving him half of my heart. I'm doing God a favor by loving him with half of my attention and half of my affection. He's getting a great deal because I'm massive. I'm doing God a favor by giving him half of my life. See, if you see yourself as, as great, the result will be that you won't be able to stop living for your own glory. You won't be able to let your hair down and trade your glory for his glory because it means too much to you. But the truth is that even if you are the Titanic, and maybe some of you are, you are quote unquote, a God among men. <laughs> Even if you are the Titanic and you stand out above everyone else, there is one who isn't just represented by the ocean. There is one who created the ocean out of his own imagination and spoke it into existence with the word of his mouth. You think the ocean's big? How about the one who created it out of nothing? You think the ocean's vast? You think it's dreadful? Yeah. You think it's beautiful and wonderful and glorious? How about the God behind it? Guys, when you see God as he truly is, you will see yourself as you truly are as well. Even the greatest among us, in comparison to him, are but a speck in the ocean. That's what happened to Mary. Mary saw Christ manifest his glory by bringing her brother back to life from the dead, from the grave, and now he's sitting at the party taking it all in. She had witnessed his glory, and she realized her glory that's represented by her hair pales in comparison. And so she bowed at his feet as a humble and grateful and awestruck servant. She said, here's my glory. It's yours. I'm living for you now. And so her love was marked by humble surrender. Finally, her love was marked by unashamed devotion. Now remember the context of this whole scene. 
is the changing of the weather. The east wind is blowing. The storm is coming in. The Jews are plotting the execution of Jesus. Anyone associated with him at this point in time is in great danger. Which is why Peter was so afraid of the servant girl at the fire when she's like, hey, aren't you one of the followers of Jesus? And he's like, no. And he curses. He actually blasphemes God because he's so afraid being associated with Jesus is not a good thing. Now, for three years, it was awesome. Traveling around with the most famous man in the the planet, healing people, casting out demons, you know, feeding multitudes, walking on water, raising people from the dead. It was awesome. And this fame was probably really cool. But all of that has changed now. Following Jesus is not going to benefit anyone anymore. From this point on, to stand with Jesus meant to stand against everyone else. The religious leaders would have branded you a heretic. The nationalists would have called you a traitor. Your friends and family would have called you delusional. And the mob would would have called for your head. If there was ever a time to take your love and affection for Jesus private, now was the time. Yeah, I've been out with you, walking the streets, hanging out in boats, feeding people, doing miracles for three years, but you know what, Jesus? I love you and all, but I'm gonna go hide for a little bit. Let me just like wait for the heat to die down. So people aren't really talking about you anymore. And then I'll come back out. But Mary doesn't do that. She is undeterred. She is unashamed. And so she actually does the complete opposite of that. In the presence of the crowd, in the presence of the disciples, in fact, there was a crowd that had gathered to watch this party, which was part of ancient culture, which is super weird. Um, But a crowd was gathered around this party to watch them eat in front of everyone. She anoints the feet of Jesus and says, this man is the king of kings. This man is the high priest of heaven. This man is the prophet that Moses looked forward to. This man's about to die for all of us. Even if you take my life, my devotion will never waver. That's what she's doing with this gift. You see, she had experienced the love of Christ. And get this, there is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. Look at how John later put it in one of his letters. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Guys, perfect love had cast out Mary's fear. And so now her love was marked by unashamed devotion. The question is, what about you and me? What about you and me? You feel the east wind blowing. You feel the storms coming in a little bit. We're no longer in Christendom, which is actually a really good thing because Christendom isn't real Christianity anyways. But we're not in it anymore. We're in a post-Christian society, a secular society. You smell the rain. You hear the thunder. You used to be respectable. Claire, Claire feels me again. You, you used to be res- respectable and acceptable for following Jesus. Not anymore. <laughs> I mean, what are the common, what are the common caricature, caricatures of us? We don't like science. We don't like reason. We live in a cave. We turn our own butter, you know? We've never read a book in our lives. We blindly follow certain politicians Following Jesus is not that great right now. Things have shifted a little bit. Do you feel that? Maybe if there was ever a time you thought about taking your faith private, now would be that time. But guys, lavish, heartfelt love and affection for Jesus will never stay private. It can't stay private. Have you ever loved something so much you just can't help but talk about it? You just can't stop yourself. Every single one of us have those things, okay? I got a list of those things. You look for ways to bring it up in conversation because you love it and you can't help it. Mary's like, I I can't even help it, guys. 
I got this love that, that is surpassed all other loves. I got this treasure that's more valuable than anything I've ever owned before in my entire life. I've seen God face to face and he calls me friend. I can't hide it. It's so embedded in your heart. It's so essential to your being that you can't keep it a secret. Like Daniel, you remember the story of Daniel in the Old Testament. He had to pray three times a day in front of his window. Why did he have to do that? He knew it was going to get him thrown to the lions. It's because he had a love for God that transcended anything that happened to him. It's why the Apostle Paul had to preach Christ in every city he went to, even though he knew he was going to get beat up for doing it every single time. In fact, before he became a missionary, Jesus showed him all that he was going to suffer. So he knew. He knew everything that he was going to suffer before it happened. So he'd be walking up to a city and be like, if I open my mouth about Jesus, I'm getting beaten with rods. Oh, this is the one where I get stoned. This is the one where I get lashed 50 times with a whip. This is the one where I get thrown in prison. Ultimately, this is the one where I get killed. But he had to do it. Why? Because according to him, to live was Christ and to die was gain because he had found Christ to be better than anything else. There was a love burning in his heart. He couldn't keep it a secret anymore. When you experience the love of Christ, when you come face to face with his beauty and his power and his glory, something changes in you. It doesn't just create a passion. It doesn't just create a humility. It actually creates courage, boldness. It enables us to worship Christ and to serve him with unashamed devotion. Now maybe you're thinking, that's great, Ben. I wish I had that. (laughs) You don't have to raise your hand, but I'm right there with you. I wish I had that. I wish I loved Jesus like Mary loved Jesus, but I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I didn't get to experience the love that Mary got to experience. I didn't get to see the power and the glory that she saw when he raised Lazarus from the dead. If I had seen him do that, then I would love him. Then I would worship him. Then I would serve him like Mary did. Anybody feeling that? problem is it's not true. And you know why we know it's not true? Because if you look at that scene, who's in the room? Judas. Judas is in the room. (laughs) Judas is ticked off. Judas reprimands Mary for her extravagant display. He saw the same miracle. He experienced the same love. He witnessed the same power, came face to face with the same glory, and yet he was unmoved. Why did you do that, Mary? We could have given that money to the poor. We could have used that money for good. What are you thinking? See, the issue for Judas wasn't that he wasn't there. The issue for Judas is that his heart was set on something else. He didn't care about the poor. He loved Jesus. He loved money. He he wouldn't give 300 denarii to the poor. He was about to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which is the price of a common slave. He wanted money, not Jesus. And so his words are a cover for his covetousness. They're a cover for his greed. He was standing before God in the flesh, the one who had just raised a man from the dead, and all he could think about was cash. Some of us are in the same boat right now, even as I'm speaking. You've seen the glory of God on display throughout your life, You've seen it in creation. 
You've seen it in suffering. You've seen him redeem suffering. You've seen him turn trials upside down for your good, for the good of those around you. You've seen it in the person of Christ, in his life, death, and resurrection as it's laid out for us in the pages of Scripture. And yet, you remain unmoved. You're still numb to it. As G.K. Chesterton once wrote, our problem isn't that we've never seen wonders. Our problem is that we have no sense of wonder. And the reason we have no sense of wonder is because our eyes have been distracted and drawn away to all kinds of other things. And many of us have been following Jesus for as long as we can remember Maybe you've seen his glory on full display. Maybe you've read of his awesome power, his extravagant love for you. You're still unmoved. Some of you I I know are skeptics, and I'm so glad that you're here, and you're absolutely 100% welcome here. You're just curious about Christ and and this religion or this relationship with him. Maybe, Maybe some of you have expectations of Christ that you think he'll meet for you if you show up. Man, I've been there. If I show up to church... If, I, if I'm good, if I clean up my act a little bit, if I stop doing all these big sins, maybe Jesus will give me what I actually want. That's what Judas was doing, following Jesus for three years, three and a half years, following him, serving him. One of his disciples, secretly, all he wanted was Jesus to make him wealthy. And when Jesus didn't get him wealthy, and when the, when the tide turned, when the weather changed, when the storm came in, he said, forget that, I'm going to sell you. I'm going to get money one way or the other. If you're not going to give it to me, I'm going to get it through you. But here's the thing, guys, and I want to close with this thought. Jesus, interest, Jesus isn't interested in sharing space with our idols. Jesus is not interested in sharing space with our idols. He wants our worship to match his worth. He wants us to give everything we have to live for his glory, to stand with him no matter who's watching. That's what love looks like. That's what Mary put on full display. That's why we're still talking about her to this day. She is the example of of what it looks like to have our hearts consumed by Christ. So if you're evaluating your own life right now, which I hope you are, and I'm sure you are, because we pray for the Holy Spirit to work, and I know he's working right now. If you're looking at your heart and you're you're realizing, I don't love like this, what you need is not to go out and try harder to love Jesus. Okay, What you need is a new set of eyes to see him as he truly is in all of his power and all of his beauty and all of his goodness and all of his glory to see him as the pearl of great price as the treasure that is beyond all others what you need more than anything is the holy spirit to take your eyes that have been looking to the left and to the right at all of these trinkets and all of these distractions that the world is like, this is good, this is better, to take your eyes off of those things and turn you true north to the one pleasure and the one treasure who can actually satisfy your soul. What you need is to see Jesus as who he is. Because once you get that vision, everything changes. So let's pray to that end that we would see as Mary saw, that we would experience as Mary experienced, that we would know Christ and that we would love him. Would you stand as we pray? Jesus, you are better than anything this world has to offer. You're more glorious and more valuable than anything we've ever chased or tasted or seen. And yet we confess that more often than not, we're distracted. We are prone to wander, as the old hymn writer put it, and we feel it. We feel it. We're prone to leave the God we love. 
So we pray that as a result of today that your Holy Spirit would work in us, that he would redirect our hearts to you, that he would give us eyes to see you, that we would feel you. Your presence would be our delight, that our worship would match your worth. And we pray this in Christ's name for your glory. Amen. All right, we're going to respond in a couple of ways. If you didn't grab...